This Week in Radio Tech, episode 204, is brought to you by the Omnia AXE and Omnia FXE software audio processors for Windows. For live stream processing and encoding, choose Omnia AXE. For file-based processing and encoding, it's Omnia FXE. Both give you precise Omnia audio processing and real Fraunhofer encoding on the web at omniaaudio.com. Kirk has a transmitter problem related to operation during FM antenna icing conditions. Between Chris Tobin's help and ideas from the Twerk chat room, I think we've got a solution. Plus, Chris Tobin explains how transmitter muting and safety lockouts are used in multi-transmitter master antenna sites. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host, and so glad to be here. This is our 204th episode, so we've been going strong with this for about four years. Holy moly. This is the show where we talk about broadcast engineering, radio engineering more specifically, audio, RF, all the techniques, the coded audio, I streaming and all that, from you know from the microphone to the, the beacon at the, at the top of the tower. Someday I'll get my beacon back in the shot here. That'd be it's kind of bright, but I'll get it back in the shot. And on this show, we've got a couple technical problems to solve. One of them is mine, and we'll see if we can get Chris Tobin to think of a technical problem that he has to solve. He should give me the problem, and I'll try to solve it, and we'll also check in the chat room. If you are watching live, you ought to sign in the chat room. You can be an Anonymous, you know, just go with a, a, a name that they make for you, or you can put your real name or some, uh, you know, uh, some uh, uh, alias in there if you want to and, and participate in the chat room. Always get some great ideas from the chat room about what to talk about or solutions to problems that we're not thinking up. Our show is brought to you by my friends at Omnia Audio and the Omnia AXE software processor and uh, stream encoder. Also by Omnia FXE, the file based. Uh, audio processor and uh, and reencoder. It's cool. Let's check it out. Uh, and our guest, I mean, excuse me, our co-host, as usual, Chris Tobin is with us. Hey, Chris, welcome in. Hello, Kirk. I'm doing well, and uh, it's uh, it's going to be a fun time. I'm just trying I, to get myself. I'm, I'm running off a MacBook yep. today. Today, something last minute. My Windows oh. laptop that I normally use uh, died. Uh, I'm not sure what exactly went wrong, but something in the mechanical portions of the hard drive just started screeching and squealing, and uh, I lost Ooh. it. So oh. if I suddenly disappear or something happens, it's because I had a last minute just th throw everything in and make it work. <laughs> so w well, what did you do to make your MacBook? Were you, did, was Skype already on it? Uh, Skype was already on it. Uh, my Logitech uh, webcam, I did not need to do anything. I just plugged it in, and it went uh, without a hitch. And I'm using a USB uh, audio interface. I had to download the drivers for that. It's an Ederol U, is it UA25 EX, which I use for everything, and it seems to be the most stable little box I've used for the last four years now. It's you know, people nice. seem to like it when we when we show other stuff on the show. I'm moving my camera right now, and we'll get a we'll see if we, we can get. Uh, oh, that's it. So that's that goes between your lav mic and USB. That is correct. That is correct. Cool. So lav mic plugs in as phantom power, and I my earpiece. And it's a nice little box. So uh, if we can put uh, my camera on, there is my audio interface that I use week in and week out. Not all the time, but almost all the time. That is a Shure X2U. It's um, XLR on this end, mic level. It can be phantom or not. I think the pa phantom power is only 12 volts, but that seems to work. And then it has a, a mic preamp level control. It has a volume control for the built-in headphone. And then it has a mix control to mix the, the mic preamp audio steers off to the headphone output and the return audio from the computer coming back as, a, you know, as if this is an external sound card is also mixed. And you can adjust the balance of that mix right here between those two things. So uh, it, it, it's worked. Well, boy, it's held up for, I guess, about three years I've had it. And uh, it's gone all around the world with me. Works quite well. <laughs> Sorry about all the camera movement there. We'll put that back on. There we go. So there you go. A little, little inside baseball as to what we're using. Well, um, so I mentioned that this show we're going to solve a couple of technical problems, and uh, we may even go in a bit of uh, depth here. As folks know that I'm uh, the engineer for a small group of radio stations. My full-time job is I work for the folks at the Telos Alliance. And uh, so I'm the head of the of the the, the Telos division. So we, you know, we do phone systems and uh, uh, codecs, uh, ISDN and IP audio codecs. Um, but I also take care of some radio stations uh, in Mississippi and in American Samoa. And so we have one station that, uh, and I don't I don't ha really have time to do all the engineering. So we do hire in people from time to time. 
And one engineer that we've hired in from time to time is Mike Patton. Mike's been a guest on the show. Uh, Mike is a fantastic uh, a contract engineer. He lives in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and he services stations all over the south. He does NRSC measurements, uh, major rebuilds. Uh, uh, we had him rebuild uh, an old FM transmitter for us. Old, I say it's old. It's 14 or 15 years old. Uh, it's, a, um, it's, an Ar- it's branded Armstrong, but it's really uh, made by the folks at RVR in Italy. And it's a uh, single tube... FM transmitter. It's capable of doing three and a half kilowatts. And it's not very tall. You know, it's this thing. It's about, I guess, uh, chest chest height. So, you know, maybe uh, three and a half or four feet tall. It's about four feet tall. And it has a single tube in it. Um, that tube is a, I want to say a 3CX5000. It's, a, it's, a, um, it's definitely a triode. So it needs a lot of drive. So if you're familiar at all with, uh, I guess we, 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 had a, we got an hour to talk here and at least a half hour on my problem. Uh, so this transmitter is, is really an amplifier. I guess it was sold originally. It had an exciter in it, like a 30-watt exciter. And then it had a solid-state IPA. That doesn't mean beer. <laughs> that means uh, intermediate power amplifier. And that IPA, solid-state, would take uh, about 19 or 20 watts coming in, maybe 9, 10 watts. Anyway, take a small amount of power coming in. It would shove out up to 300 watts going back out. And then it takes about, uh, depending on how much power you want to put on the transmitter, anywhere from 200 to 270 watts to drive the final tube in this transmitter. Again, it's an Armstrong uh, 3.5 kilowatt FM transmitter. And being a grounded grid tube, it only has about 10 dB of gain. So it's, it's not like a... I thought I shut this phone off. It's, it's not like a, um, uh, like a tetrode tube uh, or a... Um, uh, I'm trying to shut the phone off here. There we go. There's a problem. Uh, or where we have more gain, up, upwards of almost 20 dB of gain with uh, some of the, the, the 4CX tubes uh, in the tube design transmitter. So the bottom line is you got to feed it a lot of power, but it's also very stable. It doesn't need to be neutralized like uh, other power amplifier, tube power amplifiers do. Um, and it doesn't need that extra screen voltage power supply. It doesn't even need a bias power supply. It's simply a filament inside the tube and a grid, which is grounded, hence the grounded grid name of this kind of transmitter, and then an anode or the plate, which is sitting at a very high voltage, you know, five or 6,000 volts or so. And, and so you, you feed uh, RF into the, uh, uh, the, the cathode. The, the, the filament and the cathode, in this case, are the same thing. Uh, Some tubes, the filament heats up the cathode and you apply power to the cathode or you apply a signal, an input signal to the cathode, in this case, uh, or the grid. Uh, In this case, though, you the cathode and the filament, same thing. You feed it 200, 250 watts or so, and it gets amplified up to 3,000, 3,500 watts of RF power coming out. It's a Class C amplifier, which means the output of it is kind of dirty, and so it has to go through a low-pass filter uh, before it goes to the antenna because it contains harmonics of your FM signal, and those have to be suppressed. So you have to have a, 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 a harmonic filter. So... Uh, the transmitter was designed, I, I say all that to get to this point, the, 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 we no longer use the original FM exciter, and we no longer use the original uh, intermediate power amplifier. So we just use the transmitter as, a, as an amplifier. We feed it a couple hundred watts of RF from a new exciter from Nautel, and that amplifies that and, and, and ships it out to the, to the antenna. So we're, we're, we're just using it as, a, as an RF amplifier at the final stage. And we have this exciter from Nautel, is a, uh, their VS300. And so it'll, it's capable of putting out 300 watts. I think it's loafing along at, at 200 watts or so uh, to feed this tube. So here's the problem. The original design of the transmitter is like this. Um, you know that, or you, you should know that, you, 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 because the, the, uh, the exciter feeds the intermediate power amplifier in the original design, and the intermediate power amplifier feeds the the tube, they simplified things by not having different circuits that turn different things on. Basically, when you start the tube, when you start the transmitter, you turn on the filaments, and then if you want to, you can turn on the plate voltage, the high voltage on the tube, but it won't come on yet until the filaments have warmed up. So there's this timer that runs for about uh, 90 seconds to three minutes, somewhere in there, you know. And and when the filaments are uh, when the filament is hot enough, um, then it applies the plates. 
Now, in a grounded grid tube, it's perfectly okay, a grounded grid design, it's perfectly okay to apply the plates even if there's no signal coming in to the, to the uh, cathode of, of the tube. You can apply full plate voltage. The tube will not run away. It, it, it'll draw a little bit of power, a little bit of current, but it, it won't get hot. It won't, it won't run away. Uh, you won't have a meltdown. Uh, and then after the plates have come on, or when the plates come on, another relay is closed that applies AC power to the intermediate power amplifier and to the exciter. Now, that's the original design of the transmitter. So the intermediate power amplifier, it, it comes up in you know, a second or two. It's ready to go. But the exciter takes time. The exciter has an oscillator circuit that has to come up. It has to lock in to the right frequency and start modulating. And so the exciter typically would take um, 15, 20 seconds to... Uh, to, to, to start putting out RF power. And the original exciter design, and the Nautel one as well, uh, doesn't just wham, put on its output power. It, it ramps up. Once it's ready to go, once the oscillator's working and everything, the power output from the exciter goes you know, to what you've preset it for. The original exciter had a digital control. Of course, the Nautel has a digital control, and it ramps up. So the net result is you turn the transmitter on, turn the plates on, 90 seconds later, the plates come on, and at that moment, power is applied to the exciter and the IPA. The exciter, a few seconds later, it ramps up and comes on. And so the power going into the IPA ramps up. The power going from the IPA, of course, into the PA, the, the tube, it ramps up too. And so the transmitter just looks beautiful. I mean, the output power just goes like this. And, and there you go. You're, you're on the air, and it ramps up all nicely. Well, in our, when we pulled out the original exciter, we pulled out the original IPA, we put in the Nautel uh, exciter transmitter because it'll do 300 watts. Um, we, uh, and we put blank panels you know, where the old stuff used to be. The, the Nautel sits separately. Um, all this works except we're following the same logic as the original transmitter des design did. The Nautel exciter is not brought on until the plates are brought on. And via the original design, that ought to be okay. So the you know, Nautel comes on, its power comes up, transmitter all comes up, everything's cool. Everything's fine as long as we don't have one of those unusual problems like ice on the antenna. If there's ice on the antenna, the transmitter tries to come up to power. It gets too much reflected power from the FM antenna on the top of the AM tower. And the transmitter, not the exciter, but the transmitter says, uh-uh, can't do this shuts off, shuts the plates of the transmitter off, the filaments stay going, the exciter goes off, and we're off the air. Now, we don't have any real good expertise at the station. We've got a great general manager, but he doesn't know how to go into the menus of the Nautel exciter and reduce the, the power to which it could come up to. And so there's no feedback from the transmitter and its reflected power circuit back to the Nautel exciter uh, to tell it to reduce its power, all there is is power, you know, AC power coming into it or no AC power coming into it. And if the power's not, if the transmitter's not on, the, the only place the Nautel gets its AC power to come up with is from the transmitter. So you can kind of figure out the problem here. The, the exciter's not, the Nautel exciter is not on long enough to ramp its power down, even if you know how to get to the menu, because by now the transmitter's already figured out that. It's got too much reflected power and it shuts off. So there's never an opportunity in, with, the, with this design, with this logic layout, to reduce the power of the Nautel, of the Nautel exciter, which is the controlling factor for the whole thing. There, there is no power control on the transmitter. Yeah, you could unload the plate circuit, you know, but that would cause, you know, that, that'd be more problems. Um, so there, there is no screen control. There's no way to ramp the power up and down on the, on the PA uh, itself, there's only adjustment of the exciter, and the exciter's only on long enough to realize, oh, there's a problem, I'm shutting back, you know, the transmitter shuts it back off. So that's my problem. How do I make it possible? I mean, I can't even, I can't even set the Nautel exciter to a different preset remotely because it's not on. If there's ice on the antenna, if it's not on long enough, it shuts right back off, you know, within... To, however long it takes the power to ramp off, two, three, four seconds, it's shut right back off again. So how do I solve this problem? Now, you could say, well, Kurt, well, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll shut up. Chris, do you have any ideas about this? Do you understand where, what, what my dilemma is here? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I had many a Harry's transmitter that used to fold back on uh, 
crazy weather days and sometimes they did their job and sometimes they didn't do it well. Well, they did it too well, I should say, and pretty much, you know, turned themselves off. On your transmitter, the, uh, the uh, what do you call it, the Armstrong labeled one, is there a circuit that you can adjust for the foldback status or the foldback threshold or is it just literally the, the antenna goes out of tune and mm. then the the okay. the amplifier just says that's it. I'm out, I'm out, I'm out of tune. I'm shutting down. There is, is a there is a threshold that's settable. I uh, it's it's a, a little bit hard to find. I believe it's a, it's one of several multi turn trim pots in the P in in the transmitter's controller circuitry. It's got a fairly sophisticated controller circuitry. Not necessarily sophisticated doesn't make it easy to adjust, but it's it's preset from the factory. Uh, Mike Patton, I'm pretty sure you know checked its setting and if it it it. There, there isn't a foldback, remember, because there's nothing to control. This transmitter had absolutely no feedback from the Viswer detection circuit to the exciter control. I, I don't know how the original design, RVR, and then with and then relabeled Armstrong. I don't think their design had any particular foldback. Oh. If there was if, if there was reflected power, transmitter shuts off. You're welcome to take care of it some other way if you want to. And um, it seems like when that happened, I may have. In the past, when it was at a previous transmitter site, I may have gone out the transmitter site, plugged a separate power cord into the exciter, brought the exciter up, uh, and real quickly went to the right menu and lowered its power set point, uh, realizing that I was putting RF power into the unpowered IPA at that moment. So I didn't want to burn up the first transistor in the IPA. So I real quickly, I mean, I knew where to go. So I, two or three seconds, you know, I'm applying, you know, 200 watts. I, I mean, excuse me, from there, about 10, 20 watts. And I'd run it down to five, six watts or so. And, and then turn the transmitter back on. And it was, you know, it was either happy or close to happy at that point, even with reflected power. Uh, so here's, here's one idea that came to mind. Um, build up, uh, this, is, this is a, you know, this, this is a Rube Goldberg sort of solution, but it, it may be the most convenient way. Build up an A-B switch in the rack. You put it in the, you know, you put in the, in the offline position, and it supplies power to the Nautel exciter, and at the same time, it powers a coaxial switch in the exciter's uh, RG8 coax and switches it to a dummy load. So you throw this switch, exciter comes on, independent of the transmitter, and puts the exciter in a, into a dummy load, you can do all the checking and setting you want at that point. Could even have such a switch remote controllable with the dial-up remote control or, or with a, uh, an IP-based remote control. So throw the switch, go to another preset. I mean, I've, I made different presets in the Nautel exciter for lower power levels. But after I left the site, it occurred to me, wait, our on-site guy won't have a chance to go to those lower power levels because the exciter has to be on to do that. And it won't be on unless um, the transmitter's on supplying AC power to the exciter. So there's precious little window of opportunity to do anything in terms of time. Um, there is one other possibility I just thought of. On the, there's, it, right on the display of the Nautel exciter, it tells you how to turn the exciter off. That they're, The lawyers at Nautel really want to make sure that the exciter could be turned off easily. Because there isn't an on-off switch. It's a key combination. It's like the, the X box and the check mark, or maybe it's X and down. I think it's X and navigate down. Hold those two together and bam, the exciter goes. I mean, the exciter RF goes off, but the exciter stays on. So one could turn the transmitter on. As soon as it comes on and the exciter is beginning to ramp up, hit that key combination to turn the exciter off. I think you, I mean, you can do that in two or three seconds. Now the exciter, now the transmitter's on, plate voltage is on, but there's no RF coming out of the exciter. Then you go to the menu and you go to preset number two or preset number three, which are lower power levels, and then you turn the RF back on for on the exciter, and then you could be on. You could be on at a lower power level, hopefully not tripping the, the Viswar alarm. The exciter that you use, the Nautel, has any kind of remote access to its inner workings to uh, do like a foldback circuit? What do you, if that, if that, is that... VS was a VS300. Is that part of a larger frame amplifier? Does it have any feedback loop capability that you could create a voltage, say, from a bird in through line, you know, reflect it and, you know, the scaling yeah, voltage I, for it? You know what? It, it can... I'll, I'll bet you that it's, it's got some GPIO remote control, right? So it's got some pin remote control. 
Right. I'll bet you that you can you can, and, and I think it's pretty definable. Uh, what what I mean, some of them are fixed definition, and I think some are are you can assign them. So probably I could take a visor signal from the transmitter and hit a key, hit, hit a button. But the problem is, as soon as the visor trips on the transmitter, power's off anyway. Power's off to the exciter anyway. And hitting a GPIO, hitting a, a GPI on the exciter, it, it's too late at that point. Um, well, you could take your thinking of the coax relay, rather than the coax relay being in the off position, have the coax relay energized in normal operation. When it loses power from the PA, the energized position goes to de-energize, which automatically puts the dummy load across the output of the exciter. But the exciter still has power coming from a different source. At that point, your GPIO or whatever other device could be used to alter the power RF. And then you can use an IP-controlled power strip of some sort to turn back on the PA after you've determined that your RF okay, amplifier well, is in the, uh, the, the exciter is at the level you need for the, because the key of the point, uh, weather conditions. <laughs> by the way, in, in, the, in the chat room, Arnie Carl has made a few things. Uh, climb the tower with a hairdryer. Easy. Get or you can, uh, you know, a, a very popular technique that was used that's used a lot by antenna manufacturers for installations in the Northeast has always yeah. been the antenna is slightly detuned during normal weather conditions, you know, yeah. uh, nice sunny days. And then as the icing condition occurs, the tuning of the antenna moves more towards center, so the PA doesn't go out of tune or, or stays right. within the window of tuning. Or you can broaden the tuning on the PA a little bit to accept that change in antenna. Uh, change. What do you call it? Yeah, yeah, noise might go up a little bit, but you know, th th that I remember years and years ago working with a couple of continental sites and ERI antennas were designed that way. We did some exactly. measurements and said, wow, our antenna is, is mistuned. Called up Tom at ERI and he's like, yeah, that's intentional and here's why. <laughs> and it worked. And, I have to say, and, we had icing yep. conditions where you could see a half inch of ice on those rototillers and the transmitter didn't like it, but it stayed up because it sort of went into the tuned frequency it, rather than way out yeah, of tune. Yeah, well, it, 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 uh, it had farther to, farther to move before it caused a problem because it was starting out at the other end of being detuned. Oh. Not, not, not bad detuned, but I mean, like you said, on normal sunny days, no ice on the tower, it's actually slightly detuned in the opposite direction that ice tends to, 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 to detune it. Right, so right, if you start, right. If, yeah, if you start from the middle of being perfectly tuned, you know, let's say a quarter inch of ice or a half inch of ice will detune it enough to cause a problem. But if you start off slightly detuned the other direction, and and the specs are still are still fine, they're as, as good as any other manufacturer. Uh, yeah. Then you, as your ice builds up, you go through perfect tuning in the middle, and then you come out the other end, and maybe and with an up to a certain amount of ice, it's okay. Wow, um, you really? Well, then I guess the issue, yeah, the issue is your. Your power amplifier is very narrow banded. I guess doesn't like that. Um, well, I, I, it, it's, huh. it's it's the actually it's the antenna that's pretty narrow banded. It's uh, if if it is an ERI antenna, it's a ring. I think it's a ring stub design, or may it may be a uh, one of those uh, uh, helical designs. It's not a rototiller. I wish it was. I like those, but it, it's yeah, not an yeah. ERI. Well, Shively design. makes some nice ones. Also, the sixty eight hundred series is a very nice uh -huh. uh, uh, antenna, and they do they also I believe do the tuning slightly off. Jam Pro, I'm not sure of. I've used their antennas, but I've never had a situation in ice conditions to, to exhibit, uh, to see how they, how they operate. Um, yeah, not knowing the antenna design and a few other things, I'm not sure what else to offer up. But a feedback loop from, say, a through-line detector would probably be a good start. And use that voltage to try and tell the VS300, hey, I'm experiencing something, start throttling back. If the GPIOs are programmable, that's even better. But, my, my, uh, my real I, I don't goal know here. the VS300 without reading the manual to give you a better answer. There, there's um, there's there's plenty of uh, of, of uh, ideas here in, in, in the chat room, and most of them involve some money. Uh, this is in Indianola, Mississippi. Um, you know, we can we can trade if we can trade some catfish for the solution, <laughs> then you know we'll have a solution. But it's it, it, money is uh, you know cannot be uh, used to uh, solve the problem, or at least not very much of it. Uh, Wenko says install a ray dome, and for those of you who you know may not know, a ray dome is a, a fiberglass. You know, uh, lid tent uh, covering over the antenna, so that when ice does gather on the ray dome instead of the antenna, that ice is uh, several inches away from the antenna elements themselves, and therefore they don't couple as much, and the and so ice doesn't cause as much of a problem. Also, ice may have more trouble sticking to the ray dome than it than it uh, does sticking to the antenna itself. 
So uh, that's what a radome does, and that's that's certainly a possibility. But we'd have to buy radomes and get the tower crew, and it's on a wimpy little AM tower. So I'm not sure. You know, radomes would definitely increase the uh, the wind loading. Uh, somebody says fake out the VSWR de detection, and you know that's a possibility. Uh, and not or if not fake it out, at least uh, loosen it up a little bit. Uh, I, I wasn't there. I don't know at what vis were how, how many watts reflected. Uh, does it trip? I just know that they had some ice uh, a few weeks ago, and it was enough to make a trip, and so the transmitter was essentially off the air because we, I didn't have a way to tell the general manager how to reduce the power because uh, there wasn't a convenient way to do it. Well, you know uh, what you could also consider? Give uh, Armstrong a call and talk to the guys and say, look, here's my situation. I'm a financially burdened operation, and we're trying to maintain uh, you know, our week-to-week -week stuff. At what point What's the tolerance of that transmitter's output that can handle the reflected power? Mm -hmm. And they should be able to tell you, well, we normally set them for X. However, their design is such that you could probably go a couple of more watts in reflected and still operate without you know, chaos ensuing. Maybe that's sure. an approach to take. And then you just readjust the visual trip setting. Uh, and that is can. probably I'm just, the, I'm just thinking out loud, yeah. given the other situation you have to worry about regarding you know, the cost. And, and and this is Mississippi. They get ice, you know, every few years. And uh, um, I'm sure they had an ice storm back uh, 20 years ago that was just devastating. But usually we get some ice. It's, it's not a lot. It, it may be enough to detune this uh, small antenna. And you're exactly right. If Mike Patton followed the manufacturer's advice about setting the Visor trip point, it may be set at a fairly conservative setting, something that maybe even, you know, the lawyers just said to do uh, or, or some other specs said to do. And, and you know, maybe it trips at at 50 watts reflected, and look, it'll operate all day long with 200 watts reflected. Yeah, m maybe that's the case, and so that may be the best thing to do, just loosen up that. But I would talk, I, I, if I do that, I'm going to talk to Armstrong first and see what they think uh, would be a... But yeah, because what they're going to tell you most likely is, yeah, you can get away with X number of watts reflected. However, that means more heat out of the transmitter, so if you can make sure you can exhaust it better or you know, do that... Your voltages, you may have to, the power supply may not be able to supply enough current. Maybe the current rises when it starts to get in that mode. These are things you have to watch out for that, you know, a lot of times we take for granted because a lot of system designs we do, we overdo it, so it doesn't happen. But because you're in a part of the country that typically doesn't have this type of extreme weather, odds are when the antenna was designed and put together, they looked at the part of the country it's going to and said, oh, yeah, you'll be fine. You know, if this antenna was located in Vermont, and with the transmitter set up, you probably wouldn't be even discussing it right now. Just to answer a question in the chat room, I think it's a four-element um, antenna. So it has a gain of approximately 2.2, uh, you know, minus the power that's lost in the coax, inch and five-eighths coax going up the tower. It's not that tall. It's, I think it's, it's just under 200 feet tall on the tower. It's not, not a lot of coax. Uh, it's kind of a run out there. So I'm going to guess there's... Um, there's probably 280 feet of, of coax involved, inch and five-eighths, so there's a bit of loss. Anyway, the TPO from the, uh, and I, I want to say this is a 3,000-watt Class A, not a 6,000-watt Class A, I think. So, uh, any, any, anyway, it's, it's, uh, it, we, the transmitter's TPO, well, maybe 6,000 watts. The transmitter's TPO is uh, right about 2,000 watts. So, 1,800 watts uh, times 2, 3,600. It, it may be a 3,000 watt Class A. Uh, here's an idea. Um, okay, so Supersat in the chat room says, why not power the exciter differently, separately from the way it's getting it now? Because that kind of is the problem. And somehow rig up AC power output of the transmitter to activate the exciter through its uh, GPI, through, 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 a, through a closure. Um, yeah. That, you know, that, that may be the best idea right there. In other words... Um, Allow a switch to turn the exciter on and off separately, but 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 normally have a relay, a switch, or something so that the transmitter still controls the AC power like it does now. That works uh, just fine, and I kind of like that. It's it's foolproof. Nobody has to be there to hit any combination of buttons in the right sequence or something. But if I want to turn it on separately, I can. The the only problem is that, and and I I would want to try to make sure that the exciter could not be powered up in, uh, unless at least the filaments are on so that it, it doesn't get the exciter itself doesn't get too much reflected power from the uh, transmitter remember the output of the exciter directly feeds the circuit that feeds the cathode filament of the tube uh, yeah, th you there definitely may be want the filaments warmed up before you do anything <laughs> okay so otherwise the impedance there is going to be screwy 
Oh, yeah. So the exciter itself may fold back very nicely. I mean, it's, it, it, I'm sure the Nautel has a very sweet proportional fold back. It's not a on or off situation. It's a, you know, okay, that's uh, reflecting power. I'm going to back off until I get, you know, 20 watts back or, or less or whatever it may be. So, um, yeah, if, if, if I could just power the exciter separately, the, the, but remember, there's, no, there's nobody technical there at all. They may accidentally, you know, if I, if, I, if I allow them to power the exciter without powering the transmitter at all, uh, they're likely to turn the trans the exciter on and and uh, say oh it keeps folding back it's not right there's something wrong there's red lights all over it uh, that's what I have to uh, have to avoid yeah you're essentially bypassing the interlock yeah bypassing the interlock <laughs> and feeding it into a load that may not like it or the exciter the exciter may not like the load and the load itself you know, may may burn up over time I don't think I'm going to burn up the cathode of the of the uh, tube per se. Uh, with 300 watts, I mean, probably normally it, it, it has uh, uh, several hundred watts of AC going through it, a, a, a AC voltage going through it. Um, there is no well, proportional the, analog voltage. Uh, and somebody mentioned, well, put, a, put a, um, a directional coupler in there and then, you know, use the signal from the directional coupler. You can amplify it and then use that as a foldback. But then I have to buy a directional coupler, and that's hundreds and hundreds of dollars to buy. Yeah, what coupler. you need to do is come up with a solution with the tools at hand. Basically, like they did with Apollo 13. Here's what you've got. Here's what you got. Solve the you problem. You got a rectangular yes. box, and he's going to a circular cylinder. Okay. <laughs> but the problem is, the people have only supplies for a rectangular box, and they have a circular cylinder. What do we do? Um, so that's, that's basically your situation. Yeah. Wenko uh, suggests again make a make a larger visor window on the transmitter. That would probably probably make the problem never happen again. And yeah, I, uh, I think that's the approach you could. You yeah. should consider. That's a and, and, and that and that approach involves no money; just a matter of turning a screw uh, a, a few times to you know I increase the the, the visor trip point. Uh, but I would yeah, only I do mean, so. Is, it, is that if it um, you know what? Not knowing the manufacturer's history, like you know, some manufacturer of transmitters were very uh, notorious for being conservative in yeah. their uh, trip points, and over time, everybody learned to say, "Oh yeah, you've got a, a BEX, or you got a Harris this, or a Gates so and so." You know what? Here's what you got to do to adjust it because it's finicky with, with these impedances. Yes, it's typical. It doesn't mean it's a problem. They just were very, very conservative. It's very possible you call up uh, Armstrong, talk with Mike or whomever, and say, hey, look, this is the situation. He may go, well, I'll tell you what, try this, this, and this because these guys tend to be a little bit on the conservative side. And then so problem solved. You know, you may be in great shape. Someone asks if heaters are available for the FM array. Uh, at the, no, they're not. The, the antenna was not purchased with heaters. And maybe some of you have better. In fact, Chris, you can let's talk about uh, about heaters for a moment. I know we're just getting out of the the winter season, but I, what you guys got some snow there in New York, didn't you? Oh yeah, did you? We had icing. I oh you know I should have oh, no. next time if I can remember next week if it doesn't take too much time. I have pictures from a rooftop of a skyscraper in Manhattan from a month ago when ice was forming on antenna elements. And I kid you not when I say this was about a half of inch of ice and icicles hanging from these antennas. So, uh, yes, we did get snow, and we do have conditions that are not favorable for okay. properly tuned uh, radiators. So you're saying that in New York, there are probably some stations that have, uh, have been folded back on, on a reduced power level with all this ice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, well, uh, and, uh, have, and antenna heaters work well, but they can be very, very annoying over, over the life of their use. My experience is they tend not to, they are not low maintenance. And whenever no, you have to do maintenance, no. you know, several hundred feet in the air, it gets real expensive real fast. Uh, yeah, the, and, the biggest problem is it's a heating element. Think of it, uh, let me see, the best, the best analogy I could use is those of you that looked inside of a fish tank that uh, require fish to have a certain temperature of the water, mm -hmm, and you notice mm -hmm. that glass uh, test tube looking thing with a wire coil with a porcelain center, that's basically a heater. That's essentially what's inside your antenna for an FM station. Uh, if you can picture that being on 24/7 in an environment that's constantly changing, so you know, antenna sits on top sits on top of a tower, and depending on the time of day, the sun's beating down on it, the quickly cooling off of the evening, the expansion contraction of the elements. Time over time, those uh, heating components start to fail. The trick was uh, by a lot of folks. Rather than run them at regular full power, if it's a, say, 120-volt heater or 208 heater, you ran them at half voltage so that they just sort of uh, were lukewarm you know, 365 days a year and sort of extended their life. But again, depending on where you are in the country, if you have extreme weather conditions, 
uh, there's nothing that saves you from those things you know failing. It's just they they, they are high maintenance. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, I like I like the we'll, we'll we'll try the easy way first. Next time I'm I'm there, we'll try the easy way first, and then if we have to, I've never been of course I've never been comfortable with the notion that I I can't turn the exciter on without having the transmitter on. So I really, I mean, I have a dummy load that I bring with me. It's you know part of my standard fare when I drive down there, and I can you know manually take a you know take a new jumper and go from the exciter's output into a dummy load, and then I can go plug the uh, exciter up somewhere else and turn it on to my heart's content. But that's me there. You know, the general manager there has no idea what to do with the dummy load and doesn't know what to do with uh, you know with uh, patching a different uh, piece of coax in. Uh, so it's it's hey, got to hey, be. Here's a question for you: hmm? Does the VS three hundred have an external uh, mute capability, RF mute, with a you know, simple closure that's across the... That's a great the, idea. There is and, RF... And, yeah. And when it's in the mute mode, can you change... I guess you can still change the presets. So what if yeah, you have the so. exciter so. on a different power source, you know, and then when the transmitter trips off, you have a relay that's always energized. So it's, it's a positive on relay. It's like a fail-safe, uh, like an interlock. Basically, the transmitter is energized. Everything is happy, hunky dory. Everything's going along. Suddenly, the visual trip occurs. Transmitter shuts itself off. That relay, which was energized, now is de-energized. Breaks the circuit that is the RF mute, and now the exciter is muted but stays on. And you can walk up to it and go, "Okay, preset twelve or three. Here we go." And then have a reset on the on the transmitter. You know, you just power it back up. This station is it's an FM. It's twenty four seven. It never goes off the air uh, that we want it to. It would be smarter to power the exciter from a normal uh, rack strip of power, not, not get its power from the uh, transmitter only when the plates are on, but use the plate interlock. You use that same relay the, uh, connection that right now is providing the presence or absence of AC power to simply provide the presence or absence of a closure and hit the mute with uh, GPI with that on the VS300. That way the VS300, is its electronics are on all the time. It's unmuted right. whenever the plates are on on the transmitter. So when it's on but muted, yeah, you can change different presets. That's the way to go. Yeah, that was a design that Continental used on a couple of their early 10,000-watt transmitters and stuff. And people used to use it when there was an issue with the PA. Uh, yeah. The, the, uh, what do you call it? You'd mute the exciter. You still had mm -hmm. control of the exciter, so you could go into a relay box and put the RF somewhere else. But, uh, yeah, that would that, be the way to do it. Also we, consider if yeah. you go that approach, if you can – somewhere in the uh, uh, in the transmitter room or wherever you may have spare parts, you might want to come up with a bypass panel for the rack so that you don't have the transmitter uh, cycling on and off the exciter because the visvar is just straddling that, uh, that trip point if you don't want to have it up and down. Up yeah, and down. yeah, okay. You, may, you might maybe have instructions for the operators, hey, if these are the conditions that exist, hit this bypass, select preset, you know, preset number two, reset bypass, and then you should come up and you should be okay at lower power. Good deal. How's that? All right, I think we, I, th I think we got this solved. I, I'm I'm, I'm going to use the muting. I'm going to check and make sure there's muting. Should be. We should let's let, before we go, run to commercial. Uh, we should explain what this uh, this notion of muting. I first became familiar with it in the context of AM radio stations uh, that were part of a that that had you know an AM station that has a directional array that is several oh. towers and it switches patterns. So you're on the air, maybe maybe one tower daytime and 10,000 watts, but at nighttime, you go to a three-tower pattern at maybe 5,000 watts. So when you switch the, all these big relays uh, from one pattern to another, you don't really want to do that hot. You, wanna, you don't want to do that with 10,000 watts coming out of the transmitter. You get all this arcing going on when the relays switch. So what do you do? When you push the button to change the pattern, the very first thing that happens is a relay closes and it mutes the transmitter. It, assuming you're using the same transmitter for both. Or, but if you just want to shut... you know, Sometimes if you shut a transmitter off, it takes it a second to quit putting out power because it's got lots of uh, juice still in the capacitors in the power supply. So you want to mute the transmitter, which instantly cuts off the RF. It may still have power in, in the power amplifier circuit, but it doesn't have any you know, throughput power. So you mute that. So now there's no energy on the relays, the big RF relays. You switch them, and then you let go of the mute, and the transmitter comes back on, perhaps at a different power level, perhaps even a different transmitter if you're switching transmitters. But the point there is 
you that I learned about that with working with AM directionals. Did did you find that muting was used uh, with the, uh, pattern switching in your area? Oh yeah, yeah. My first uh, my first job in broadcasting was an AM station directional three tower dog leg, uh, you know, the shape of an L basically. And uh, yeah, we had a five kilowatt. And once in a while, the RF relays would not properly you know, mute and switch like they should. And boy, let me tell you, that, uh, that, that silver-plated contacts would splatter all, si- all over the insides of the cabinet. Uh, but yeah, the muting was key. <laughs> the tube transmitters were great for muting because they would be, a, like you say, slow discharge. So you'd have to mute the transmitter, time it for about, I think, five seconds before you did a switch. That was enough time for everything to de- de-energize. Switch and then mm-hmm. come back up. The solid state transmitters are great because they just mute like like an on off switch. It's just boop. Uh. <laughs> you know, watching a fifty thousand watt solid state transmitter mute while switching patterns is like, oh boy, here we go, here we go. Up, oh, that went very nicely. But then <laughs> again, yeah, mute, yeah. I have seen the fifty thousand watt transmitter relay switches go and then one of them not properly seat and explode. So that wasn't funny. Oh, it, it it is amazing that you that a muting control on a fifty kilowatt AM transmitter. You just close this little closure, just a little boop. And 50,000 watts is suddenly, and within just a couple of cycles, it's gone. Yeah. And then you unmute it, and boop, comes right back. 50,000 watts, just back, yeah, like that. You know, like, you know, you're talking 25 amps of RF at the base of the yeah. tower. You know, that's a lot. That's arc-welding so, material. Um, uh, uh, with FM transmitters, I'm guessing, you tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm guessing that muting was put in as a feature on FM exciters, um, uh, hence the rest of the transmitter, for the purpose of, let's say you had two FM transmitters that were combined. You know, they're running exactly synchronously. Let's say you need a 40-kilowatt transmitter power output to the antenna, and you have two 20-kilowatt transmitters feeding through a, a 3dB hybrid combiner, and you want to switch. Let's say one transmitter fails. You want to switch and put the other transmitter on straight on the air. Before you do that RF coaxial switch with FM, you want to mute that transmitter make the switch, and then un- unmute the transmitter. Is that, is that why they would put that in an FM exciter? Uh, the FM exciters had that because you want to turn off the transmitter when you're switching between, say, your A and B transmitters on a single antenna. Mm, or if you're mm. a combined output, yes, you can do that. I think okay. it was put in there more for a safety and design. Because you know, if you had a site, a traditional FM site, where you had two transmitters and a single antenna, you had to switch between the two. Now, you didn't want to switch between the two transmitters hot, so you have to mute one or make sure one stayed muted while the other one came on. Uh, gotcha. They also use the mute switch, I believe, for, you know, you have a dummy load. So you make sure the dummy load is either functioning, uh, is the fans that cool the dummy load are up operating before the transmitter turns on and feeds the dummy load. So that's another ah, kind of safe. So you use uh, external interlocks for, yes. for things like that. I mean, you want to make sure the, the fan, the blower is running through that dummy load before you apply 10,000 right. watts to it. Yeah, the, okay. the, the muting function is, you know, is a byproduct of the interlock system of the transmitters. So I'm that's, so that's glad we had this conversation because I wouldn't have thought of the muting function. I haven't used them. You know, very few of the sites that I've ever taken care of used the muting function. There may have been a couple where we had a main and a backup transmitter. Most of my engineering has been at small and medium stations where uh, switching to a backup was rarely an automatic or a remote control function. It was you go to the transmitter site. You patch this manually because nobody would pay for a seven thousand uh, dollar, you know, RF switch. So right, you go right. do it very manually, and doing it manually, you know, you, you shut things off anyway. So, well, that's it exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all, uh, I've I've worked at both sites. The one you described, where there is no coax switch, and sites mm-hmm. where there is a coax switch, and then sites that have a coax switch but didn't bother using the muting function at all. And that, that made for an interesting uh, occasion. <laughs> it burns up yeah, that, pretty cool. Yeah, that was a fun yeah. phone call. You know, who are you? <laughs> we don't have an engineer, but we have a problem. We're not sure what it is, but something's buzzing and burning in the transmitter building. Like, <laughs> I hope you vacated the building. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything's turned off, but we're not sure what to do. There was a coax switch that didn't have a muting uh, relay connected, and they switched between their 10,000 watt FM to their, uh, from their main to the backup and never turned off the main, so the switch turned, you know, it just spins, breaks the yep. circuit to the, tra- the antenna, 10,000 watt arc inside the color X switch, <laughs> and that was just a pile of melted metal between all the contacts. It was, uh, it was an interesting smell, and the, when we popped the cover on that switch, it, there was some uh, metal that oozed out of the, uh, the, the, the shaft, you know, where it spins, where you have the handle where oh, you can do yeah. a manual control. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, RF, RF is a funny thing, you know. You, you know, the laws of physics. You can uh, 
you can play with and twist, and if you try to break the rules, they do sometimes come back at you in the full force. You're watching This Week in Radio Tech or listening to it. This is episode number 204. I'm Kirk Harnack along with Chris Tobin. And uh, we've, we've morphed this show right into a good conversation about RF muting. I never thought that'd be the subject of a show, but it turns out it's pretty important. We, we, we think we've solved a problem that I have at one of my radio stations, and now we're talking about the whole concept. Chris, after the break, I want you to describe for us the muting and safety procedures and VisWare protection procedures when you have a multiple transmitter site that, with a combiner. So maybe at top of, uh, of um, uh, Empire State, you can tell us about how that works. Somebody in the chat room brought that question up. We've been talking primarily about you know, single stations, one transmitter into one antenna. That's what my stations are. But you've worked at places where things can go wrong in various places when you have you know, 12 transmitters or eight transmitters being combined, FMs I'm talking about here, being combined into one antenna, uh, master antenna system. Where do you put the protections uh, in order to protect what has to be protected, but not taking people off the air unnecessarily? So we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. Our show is brought to you by my friends at Omnia Audio. And I want to mention to you a really popular product, Omnia AXE. What is it? It is Windows software. runs on XP or Windows 7. I believe it runs on Windows 8 as well. And this is probably the least expensive way to do high-quality streaming on the internet. Omnia AXE is a combination product. It has Omnia processing in it. It's, it's a, a wideband uh, input audio processor. It's a three-band, multi-band audio processor to handle multi-band processing for your, your music, your voice, speech, whatever your programming is. And then it's some very intelligently designed look-ahead limiters uh, for stereo, left and right channels. And these are smartly designed so you don't get the... Um, the artifacts that look at limiters that are just designed from a math function can generate. These are highly researched by Frank Foti and his team, Rob Dye, Mark Manolio. Uh, this was just before uh, Cornelius Gould came on board with us. So uh, uh, they're really smart look at limiters. And then after this Omnia processing in Omnia AXE software, then you have stream encoding. And you have the full suite of uh, popular Fraunhofer encoders, the real licensed encoders, the, the reference encoders. So you can get, uh, you can stream in AAC. Uh, of course, you can stream in MP3. Uh, you can stream in AAC, a high efficiency AAC. And also the very popular HEAAC V2, which lets you stream at bit rates on the order of 56 kilobits per second. 48 kilobits per second, even down to 24 kilobits per second. And you'll be surprised at the amazing uh, entertainment audio quality of, a, of an HEAAC V2 stream uh, when it's done at like 48 or 56 kilobits per second. Really sounds amazing. And many, many internet broadcasters are going to that stream. It's low bit rate and the quality is really amazing. Now, I'm not saying it's, it's unimpeachable or like linear. Of course it's not. But, uh, you know, would you rather have 2.4 megabits per second or 56 kilobits per second when you're sending streams out to listeners who may be mobile, maybe on mobile devices, on Wi-Fi, on 3G, on 4G? Uh, so th there you go. I, I check it out. Uh, our former our guest on the show several times, Greg Oganowski, highly recommends uh, HEAAC V2 as a standard that people ought to be streaming with. So that's. That's one product, Omnia AXE. It's uh, not expensive. I think it's it's well under five hundred dollars, maybe under four hundred dollars uh, list price. Um, and I'm using it at my radio stations in Mississippi and in American Samoa. Uh, it's just a great solution, uh, and it just. It, by the way, it runs as a service in Windows, not as an app. It runs as a service. So at that low level, it's extraordinarily reliable. It's just down there right above the kernel level. And, and so just as, just as a printer service would run and, and, and other you know, such thing, you know, comm services, it runs right there. So it's, it's, it's like it's hard to kill. Uh, you have full access to it, though, with a browser. You do all your setup with a, with a browser. The other product that's interesting is Omnia FXE. And podcasters should take note of this product. Omnia FXE is a file-based audio processor that you, you drag a file. Let's say you do a program. You, you do a podcast. You want to make it available, but you want the audio quality on it to be consistent. You don't want really loud and really soft, and you don't want to be too tinny or too bassy. Well, Omnia FXE is the same processing algorithms as Omnia AXE, but it's able to process an audio file faster than real time. So you drag a one-hour show in there, and honestly, I don't know how long it takes to come out, 10 minutes or 2 minutes or, or 30 minutes, but it's faster than real time. Depends a lot on your CPU, I suppose. And the, uh, the audio file you get back is the same file, 
but now the audio is really sweet. And when you stream it out or somebody downloads it, they're going to hear the same program, but with the good audio processing qualities that you get with Omnia uh, AX uh, processing. So check it out, if you would, on the website Omnia AXE and Omnia FXE. So thank you for your support of that, and I appreciate Omnia sponsoring our show. This is uh, episode 204 of This Week in Radio Tech. Uh, Chris Tobin, our usual co-host, is here with me. We're talking about, uh, we got on the subject of, of solving my problem in Mississippi with a little transmitter when there's ice on the, on the antenna, and we think we figured out a, a way to allow it to get fixed. And um, now we're talking about, uh, we're going to move on to the subject of multi-transmitter transmitter sites like they have at Empire State Building in New York or many other sites in big cities, especially across the country, where you have two, three, four, even 12 FM transmitters operating at reasonably high powers through a combiner, which is a big honking device, takes up a room and yeah. combines all this power from the different transmitters uh, each transmitter, by the way, thinks it's all alone. That's the key here. A combiner lets a transmitter operate power into it without reflecting any back of its own or of the other stations. You can't just twist tie the outputs of transmitters together and send them to the antenna. That doesn't work. So you use a, a very uh, specially co uh, a designed combiner, and then you send all that power uh, up to the antenna. Now, Chris, tell us about how people protect themselves in those situations. Okay, well... Um at the Empire State Building, for an example, because it's a combined system of about 16 FM stations, you can imagine the amount of power that is generated by 16 50 kilowatt ERP stations. So that's about uh, over 100,000 watts of uh, RF, actually a little more than that. And um, in order to prevent uh, trouble, first things first, at the Empire State Building, you're required to understand something about RF safety. So this is one of the Ooh. things you'd be reading about, RF frequency site safety, awareness training, and whatnot. This is one of many companies that uh, offers these things. And as a tenant, you have to uh, be aware of the safety uh, involved. And in, in the case of Master Antenna, Master FM, what you would do is the procedures would be all the stations agree to a shutdown. Say, say I have to do work on my FM transmitter. My combiner, one of the filters in the combined system, is in trouble. Uh, maybe it detuned. Maybe it's, uh, it's suffered an arc. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Well, however, whatever the case is, that needs to be pulled out of the system. Well, there are ways to bypass that filter and let everybody else continue on, but you don't do it live. So uh, what you do is you schedule a shutdown. And you can schedule a shutdown and switch to a backup antenna. And it's a very simple, straightforward procedure. It's not done all the time, but you know, when it's done, it's done on the overnights. But when you do such a, a procedure as a shutdown of a multi-combined system, you have what's called the RF safety officer, or someone who's been designated uh, the person who will do the following. Verify that there is a person at each of the room transmitters, the transmitter rooms themselves, to shut off the mm -hmm. transmitter. If a person is not available to be at the transmitter because the radio station may not have the personnel for that reason or the cost is involved, then the safety person has the ability to remotely uh, shut off their transmitter using the interlock system. Okay. And then the safety person has to notify oh, wait, so, so, all of wait, the operators. So, the, the safety yeah. person may be at a central location, maybe in the combiner room itself. or In the combiner the room, the RF safety person is watching. He can yes. shut off people's transmitters from there for safety purposes, right? Yes, yes. The interlocking okay. system goes through the combiner room, and then there's a monitoring point. You have several bird meter panels. I shouldn't say bird. You have RF watt meter panels that yeah. indicate power from all of the transmitters coming into the combiner system. There's also what they call the RF plunger. So if you can think of a coffee can cylinder-sized device with a handle on it and a, and a rod that goes into the center, what that does is shorts out your feed from the transmitter into the combiner system in the event that uh, the interlock system fails. So you oh, have all these little plungers. I that saw those. Them. That's what they do. They actually short out somebody's feed. Right. So, and that hopefully the transmitter shuts off at this point doesn't become an arc welder. Well, yeah, that, it's, 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 it's designed to you know, basically fail safe, you keep everything safe. Uh, really and that, and okay. then there's a procedure that every station calls up to the combiner room safety person and says, I'm here, I'm powered off. Safety person com confirms the meter reading, says, yes, you are, stays off, lock them out. You know, they turn off the interlock feature on that, that transmission line all the way through. Once everything has been deemed powered down, RF safety goes through one more check, says, okay, fine, then tells the antenna manufacturer or the vendor, whoever's on site to do the repairs, you now may proceed with the maintenance that you're going to do. And then you just reverse the order. That's, that's, it. that's it in the simplest nutshell. It basically comes down to a combined site requires cooperation amongst all the tenants on the antenna system. I have a and question here. Now, at, at, you're, you're, you seem to be speaking 
kind of specifically about Empire State because I take it at at Empire State New York, uh, these transmitter rooms are scattered about a couple or three different floors, and that's correct. The people can't see each other. That's correct. I, I I have been to combined sites like in Miami, where you might have several transmitters, and they may be in cages, wire cages from each other, so you know people's property is secure. But you can see physically see all the transmitters that are going into the into the combiner. That's correct. Uh, so you still yeah. use the same procedure. You may uh -huh. modify it. So you have a room full of transmitters. Okay, you're at a combined site. It's one big flat building. It's a single level, and you've got 16 transmitters in a in a room, and they're all sectioned off by say uh, you know fences or cages, whatever you want to call it. You still should have someone physically verify, visually verify that that transmitter that's part of the system is powered off. Because remember, the local transmitter settings could have been altered, somebody could have bypassed something you don't know. So you can look at the transmitter and say, oh yeah, everything is off. Meanwhile, there's RF coming out the, the spigot and going into the combined you know, a hybrid uh, panel. So you, you still use the same procedure, whether you're on the top of the Empire State Building where you can't see everybody, or if you're in a room that has you know, everyone in there. You still do the safety is, it's, it's like, um, you know, if you ever watch movies with uh, submarines or when the, the military, like an aircraft carrier, if you ever notice when a command is given to say, change the direction of the boat, and they say, yeah. you know, 10 degrees down bubble for a submarine to go down. How many yeah. times do you hear that repeated? And oh why is that? That's because you have to make sure that once you make that command, the person who's going to execute it is confirming, yes, this is what we want to do. And then they, they respond back with 10 degrees down bubble. The person who said, do it, now gets confirmation back that it's been done. He knows what to expect. He moves on to the next thing he's, do, he's executing. The same is yeah. true at RF safety. It's you, know, you, top, you climb a tower. You send somebody up to the top of the tower. You confirm they're there. They, they confirm that the power's been turned off already, so they, they ascend to the, the level that they need to work at. And when they're ready to come down, they contact down below and say, we're now descending. And then the guy at the ground level waits until he hears all clear and then tells the transmitter people, okay, you can power back up. And that, uh -huh. that's the same principle. So whether you're on top of a building, you're on a single level floor a house, at a, you know, a transmitter tower, same procedure, just modified a little bit. The idea is not to assume anything. When you assume, we all know what happens. And in the <laughs> RF, it can hurt. So it's Extreme. a little different. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But that, that's really what it comes down to is just understand procedures. Say, hey, we're going to power down the 16 transmitters. Let's confirm. It's like, well, here's another example again for confirmation, uh, uh, authentication, if you will. You ever watch a space shuttle launch, space shuttle operations? Do you ever notice that the one guy in charge, you know, what they call Capcom, Cap Capsule yeah. Communications, he says, flight, they say, flight, go, you know, health or bio, go. When they're saying that, what they're saying is, we follow procedures, everything's in order, you now can proceed to the next level for what you need to execute. So I'm the RF safety guy. I'm going to call up on the intercom and say, you know, transmitter room two. Oh, we're off. Okay. Transmitter room three, four, five, boom. Then I go, I look at my panel. I got all, you know, zero indicators. Great. I proceed to the next level. What is that? I activate the interlock bypass and boom, we go to work. But this way, along the, the steps along the way can also make sure that, say, transmitter room six or transmitter cage seven, suddenly the guy says, oh my God, my transmitter just came back on. Because we're taking these executed steps, he can quickly jump on the intercom or whatever method you have for communicating and say, stop, or you know, something is hot. And right away, I, as the person orchestrating this, knows to stop everything I'm doing and you know, immediately move to the next procedure for emergency shutdown or whatever may be the case. That's, so uh, that's, that's in a nutshell. I mean, it's, it gets yeah. more complicated, but that's in a nutshell. I'm sure. I've got two questions, and, and then we're going to have to close out the show. We're getting tight on time. Uh, question number one. I take it that at a place like Empire State Building or other sites where you've got 16, you've got a, you know, combined transmitters, there's probably uh, – each transmitter, of course, has its own uh, through-line watt meter to see how much forward, how much re reflected power. Is yeah. there another through-line watt meter uh, just as the RF power enters the combiner? Or do we assume that that's good based on the transmitter's reading? Oh, no, no. And you have monitoring coming in and going out. So you have monitoring okay. coming in from each of the transmitters. Then you yep. have monitoring going out of the combined system. So you can that's, see that's the my aggregate. Question. So out of the combined system, you got a huge amount of power, all the combined power. And right. if that visor gets, if that reflected power there gets too high, will that shut everybody off? Or what, what happens yes. if, the, if the combined power becomes too high? It will shut down the system. Everybody. Okay, so the oh, next yeah. question is, if there is 
some reflected power from the master antenna, but not enough to shut the system off. How much of that reflected power or that mistuning of the antenna, which causes reflected power, how much of that gets reflected through the combining system back to each individual's transmitter? Probably there, very there, little because of the very little because the filtering process is the the buffer between the devices, the impedance changes. So your transmitter sees the impedance of the filtering system, and that's pretty much what it's tuning to. Oh, okay. So hopefully, you, you know, it's like tuning a duplex for a two-way radio or a ham repeater. Okay. You know, hopefully the antenna's reflected uh, power is not enough to override that. And then that that creates a whole another series of issues. But yes, so, there's always going to be a little bit of reflected. It sounds like there's a little bit of coupling there, but the but the the combining system really does a, a pretty good job of isolating not only transmitters from each other. We know that because uh, you know one transmitter can't see the output of another transmitter; that'd be bad. Uh, but it also buffers a transmitter's what it's seeing from the end of the circuit, the the, the antenna. Yeah, because by design, the filtering technique it, that's inherent in the way it's designed. You know, you, you'll always have some type of reflection or something coming back because of just the physics involved. Can you ever have zero visual? No. That's why you have the tolerance of 1.1, 1.3, 1.5. .1 and, you know, sometimes a lot of people tolerate 1.15 to 1.2, and that's it. Uh, but it, it's a balancing act, and you just, you know, you just build accordingly and, and you maintain it. The trick is when you're doing combined systems, you really do need to pay attention to proper uh, preventive maintenance and understanding your limitations because... That's just a balancing act. You, you, you know, I can tell you from experience over the years, and it happened in New York many, many, many years ago, when one of the combiners didn't properly function, it blew out, it took everybody out, and it was just a mess. And you know, it, it can happen. So if you don't stay on top of it, you're in trouble. We're going to put a couple of uh, websites in the show notes. Uh, it's been pointed out that... Um Minneapolis-St. Paul has a big combiner system. We'll put a, uh, a link from uh, Scott Feibush's uh, Tower Side of the Week to that. Also, I believe we also have some links to um, Empire State Building, the place we've been talking about in the last part of the show here. So we'll have pictures of that so you can visualize what, kind of what we're, what we're talking about. we got to go. Chris, yeah. this has been fun. I appreciate your participation and uh, all the info and helping me solve my problem. Oh, you're welcome. Anytime. <laughs> Our show has been brought to you by my friends at Omnia Audio and the Omnia AXE. Uh, software-based, runs on Windows, uh, audio processor, and stream encoder. And also Omnia FXE, the file-based uh, audio processor. Check those out on the web at omniaaudio.com. Next week, our guest is Rich Rary from NPR Labs. If you have ever listened to a show from National Public Radio, there's a fair chance that you have heard Rich Rary's name, especially on Fridays during the credits at the end of All Things Considered. Uh, I used to hear Rich Rary's name quite a bit there. And so Rich is a, a real gentleman, a great engineer. He's going to be with us uh, next week on This Week in Radio Tech. We're looking forward to the NAB show coming up in a few weeks. Our show on Thursday during NAB, what is that, uh, that date? Uh, April the... Oh, good question. Is it April the 3rd or 10th? 10th. April the 10th. 10th. Uh, we're going to be live from the show floor at NAB for This Week in Radio Tech. So I'm looking forward to that, too. And more guests uh, in between uh, the, then and, uh, and now. So hope you'll stay tuned. Uh, be sure you, you do uh, uh, check out the other shows on the GFQ network. We're uh, hosted on the GFQ by Andrew Zarian and his team. And there are plenty of other shows as well, like What the Tech, Matt Men, and uh, well, just lots of other good stuff. Uh, uh, so check it out on, uh, this week, on, on the GFQ uh, network. Uh, gfqlive.tv it's a good place to uh, keep your browser tuned to alright guys that's it we'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech bye bye, bye, -bye.